Welcome back to the uh, to the Mesa Talks public lecture series, and uh, let me adjust my camera here. I'm uh, Chester Levash, the project archaeologist with the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, and uh, we will be joined today by Amanda Semenko, who will be talking about uh, prehistoric dogs, and uh, in particular in uh, the context of the Membrace site. Mm. I believe it was uh, Kip Ruin. Uh, <laughs> sorry about the, uh, the the shakes, folks. For those of you who have been watching, you know I'm normally not this shaky to uh, get going here. Uh, before we dive in, we've got a couple of announcements. First up is, uh, you know, of course, I also host the Chat with the Archaeologist series. We will be, instead of going at our usual time at 2 p.m. on the second Friday, of the month, we will be going at noon the second Friday of the month for September, and we will be joined by, um, uh, well, <laughs> I can't recall off the top of my head here, uh, Michelle Turner from Crow Canyon will be joining us for that one. Uh, so that should be good. And uh, in other news, uh, I know on the last chat with the archaeologist, uh, I said that uh, Mesa Prieta would be opening up for tours. The um, Not even a full day later, we got word that we would not be opening for public tours. However, we can run private tours. There are some stipulations. So if you're interested, uh, email us or uh, call us at the office. Our phone number is on our website uh, and also on our Facebook page. So if you want to book a private tour, we can accommodate that, but we are not currently doing public tours. All right, so that's it with announcements, and I'm going to bring in uh, Amanda. So welcome to Mesa Talks, Amanda. I'm excited for your lecture coming up here. Uh, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit more? Yeah, um, let, let's do a little bit of uh, introductions here. So uh, what, what are your research interests? Where did you go to school? Um, and, and how does this, this talk relate to that? Oh, in archaeology. I'm, I'm sorry, Amanda, I had you mute, muted, but um, you're oh. back on. <laughs> And, uh, okay. All right. I don't think we um, lost anything there, so uh, pick it up. Uh, okay. No worries. No worries. From the beginning, or? Uh, yeah. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, uh, your research, where did you go to school, okay. and um, and how this paper relates to all of that. All right. Fantastic. Um, my name is Amanda Semenko. Um, I'm originally from the Minneapolis area, and I'm now happily in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I just finished my master's last year at New Mexico State University under uh, Bill Walker and Ronnie Alexander with the assistance of Frank Ramos working on stable isotope analyses. Um, and this actually is mostly my research from my master's thesis. So it's a, a dog burial, as you'll see, um, from around 600 AD in southern New Mexico. It's uh, my, my passion project as well. I've really enjoyed researching this. and. Um, it's really motivated me to uh, work towards other research in the Southwest, particularly with faunal remains. So I'm currently volunteering right now at uh, the Arizona State Museum, working with Martin Welker on some faunal analysis of different sites across the Southwest. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, for that introduction. So um, Amanda, uh, I know I'm excited for this talk. I'm sure our audience is. So uh, whenever you're ready, please take it away. All right, sounds great, thank you. All right. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm really excited to talk to you about my favorite research topic so far, uh, prehistoric dogs of the American Southwest. This on your screen is Rudy. Um, I like to call him Rudy. It's, uh, I spent a lot of time analyzing and measuring and hanging out with Rudy over the last couple of years. So um, he needed a name <laughs> or it needed a name. Um, I'm gonna start talking off with, uh, with um, 
some of the dog roles that have that are some of the roles dogs have had in human culture in the past 20,000 plus years uh, since domestication. And then I'm going to go into some examples about um, their origins and then domestication, as well as some of the earliest dogs in North America before moving on to Southwest examples. And then finally, the big part will be on this case study from Kip Bruin, which was my master's thesis research. Dogs have had so many roles in human culture for the last uh, 20,000 plus years. They're hunting companions, they, they help track and then they help go after game. And then uh, they also carry packs and, and they drag travois with heavy weights on them so that humans don't have to do it. Uh, their hair has been used for textiles. Uh, the, the Northwest Coast Salish have used their hair for blankets or they used their hair for blankets for a very long time. And sometimes they're used for food and their hides. There are a few ethnic ethnographic examples from the Hopi that demonstrate this, where um, somebody was going to kill a dog and planned on eating it and using its hide for some leg warmers. I know I personally like to use my dogs as bed warmers, particularly when I'm camping in the mountains. Um, <laughs> and of course, companionship and kitchen cleanup. That one is absolutely key in my house. I do not want to have to deal with that. That's what the dogs need to be in the kitchen for. So um, those are some of the more everyday roles. They've also taken very a lot of ceremonial roles throughout the world. And particularly in the Southwest, we find this when they're buried or interred in kivas. We'll find them a lot of times placed on kiva floors or they'll be buried with humans um, or also on the floors or in the roof fall or the um, fill of ritually closed rooms. And then there's also an example from Hopi also where uh, dog hides had been used to cover masks that were going to be used for the Niman ceremony. So they've had so many different roles and I'm sure you can all think of of many different roles that I didn't even include here that dogs are used for for today. And they're very helpful companions to our lives. So before I get into some of the more specific stuff, um, these are my dogs. <laughs> James is on the left and Lily's on the right and they are just as cute and cuddly as they look. They're also a little bit ornery and really sassy because they're approaching 14 years old and uh, they have bad backs, so I don't blame them. Um, and, you know, this is really a far cry from their ancestors, the gray wolf. So you don't expect to see a lot of dogs in prehistory that have these kinds of traits of these really long backs and these short little stubby legs. Um, most of the dogs in the Southwest prehistorically probably looked like coyotes, early historical accounts of people describing the dogs from the Southwest. They generally say that they resembled coyotes. And so there's a lot of times talk about these dogs that are either, you know, slightly smaller than a coyote or slightly larger than a coyote. Um, across North America, they had much different sizes of dogs, particularly those that were used to pack as pack animals or to carry to pull trebois. They were much larger than what we see in the Southwest prehistorically. Um, so dogs were domesticated at least 23,000 years ago in Eastern Asia. And up until recently, we had thought that they had come through this ice-free corridor as they migrated across the Bering Strait into Orbringia into North America. But most recently, um, this year, in fact, a publication was released that shows the, the most, the oldest dog in North America that we currently know about um, is actually in Southeast Alaska on the coast. And so they're, they're um, their suspicion is that they were in fact traveling on a coastal route, a Pacific coastal route mm -hmm. into North America instead of that um, ice-free corridor. Uh, and so this bone on the left is the bone in question. And when they first found this and they first uh, identified this, they actually thought it was a bear. And that's why it took a while for them to determine that it was actually the oldest dog is because uh, originally it was seem to be a bear. It's a very small fragment of a bone and um, it's about 10,180 years old, give or take I think 260 years. So it, it is just a little bit older than these guys and these are the dogs from Stillwell and Coster 
Uh, they're about 10,000 years old, and there's one other of these burials that is also around the same time period. And these are actually the oldest known individually dug, individually buried dogs in the world. So not just in North America, but in the world. There have been dogs that were maybe in, in other human burials or something before this, but these are the oldest that were individually buried by themselves. And, and you can actually see this is really good preservation for 10,000 year old faunal remains. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to think about the fact that these are in Southern Illinois, which is quite a long distance away from you know, Southeast Alaska. And you can imagine that there's probably a lot of other archaic dogs that we don't know about yet that are somewhere in between or, or further North in Alaska. Um, only time will tell, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. All right, and then we're going to move into the Southwest. And this is a, a map that shows not only Canis familiaris, which is domestic dog, and that's in, I think, a gray, a little gray plus sign, but also Canis species as well. And I'll get into it a little bit more later, but it's really difficult to differentiate between Canis species, um, animals, as far as dogs and coyotes, particularly in the American Southwest. They're approximately the same size. Their bones look very, 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 very similar. There's only a few differentiating features that can really help you identify whether you have a dog or a coyote. But the two do really mean very different things when we find them. Um, and then also with the little blue plus signs, those are dog artifacts. They could be dog hair um, sashes. That was a common thing to find at some of these sites. I guess really not that common, but we do have quite a few of them in museum collections. And then um, the Bruin, the site that we will be talking about is down there in New Mexico, southern, southwestern New Mexico. And I'm going to start off talking about White Dog Cave up there with the nice red arrow. All right, the so White Dog Cave is a really interesting site. Um, it's obviously a cave, it's Basket Maker 2, so it's approximately 400 BC or a little bit later maybe. These remains were naturally mummified because of the context of the burials being in sand in a high and windy cave that was um, un, untouched by rainwater, really. So they naturally mummified and preserved these dogs like this. And they were found in burials with humans. The one on the left had been found in a burial with a female and it had been covered by a basket. So they didn't see it at first when they were excavating all of the other burial sites. Um, and then the one on the right was found in the same fish with a male, next to a male. And the, the one on the right is actually what they were referring to when they called this white dog cave. It may be more yellow in person and even in this picture, but that was what they were talking about. Uh, the one on the right is about one and a half years old and they did find the presence of a baculum when they were CT scanned. So that one is a male. Uh, they don't know about the one on the left and it was about eight months old. All right, so the next site I want to talk about is known uh, by a couple of different names. First, we referred to it as artificial leg in um, the work done in the early 90s. It's referred to as River's Edge. And what I think is spectacular is this really beautifully excavated and, and very well preserved dog remains. This is in the bottom of a cyst um, that's just north of two pit houses. So it's in relationship to human occupation. So it's probably uh, Basket Maker 3. Most of the site there is Basket Maker 3 to Pueblo 1 period. Um, there were, when Frisbee excavated in the 60s, there were six other dogs that had also been um, excavated, five of which were also in storage pits similar to this one, and one was on the pit house floor. What's most interesting about this dog, besides its absolutely excellent preservation, is that um, it has they noted that there were healed fractures of the pelvis, um, find. pelvis, ribs, and vertebrae that had healed. So um, this dog had already suffered some wounds before it had died, and then they obviously managed to heal before it died. But what's most interesting is then it wasn't it wasn't consumed at all, and it wasn't skinned. So we know it was completely intact because otherwise some of these bones would have most likely shifted quite a bit more than than they obviously have. So um, obviously really great excavation work here. It's really beautiful, really beautiful picture. 
All right, and then moving a little bit northeast, just south of Santa Fe, we have Arroyo Hondo. And I don't have any pictures for you of Arroyo Hondo, but Arroyo Hondo is a really interesting case. Um, I'm sure Victoria Monocle can tell you all about that. There's a, a really, really interesting thing about the coyotes that they found there was that um, there's a lot of a lot of canis species and coyotes that probably that had very similar diets to dogs, and some of them turned out to actually be coyotes, even though they had been buried in locations suggesting that they were dogs. And that leads to the next paper that I want to talk to you about briefly. Um, Kemp in 2017 had done a paper where he was trying to show movement from the Four Corners to the Northern Rio Grande using turkeys and dogs, which were the only two prehistoric domesticated animals in the Southwest. And unfortunately, all of the turkey or all of the dogs that they were trying to relate in the Northern Rio Grande area actually turned out to be coyotes because it is very difficult, I will stress again, very difficult to know for sure whether you have a dog or a coyote. And sometimes it really does require DNA testing to know for sure. Um, one of the best, some of the best methods for distinguishing between the two um, involve the mandible. Uh, I like to use this, this indicator here. You have this posterior hook of the um, ascending ramus on the dog, and then on the coyotes, this is stick straight. And then there is a little bit of differentiation between like these tend to be a bit straighter. Um, and I'll show you here on this, on the left side, this larger one is a coyote and this, this shorter one is a dog. Their bones are really quite similar, but if you'll notice with the dog's bones, they're a little bit stockier. They're a little bit um, more sturdy looking. And then the coyotes tend to have a little bit more elegant grass all bones. And I think that's really because the, the dogs are domesticated from gray wolves and gray wolves have these very thick, stocky, sturdy bones and sturdy bodies. So, um, but once again, I don't, I don't blame anybody that can't tell the difference because it's very, very hard. And especially if you only have postcranial elements, um, it's, it's almost impossible. So that's why we end up with a lot of things like on this map where you'll see people have called things canis species is simply because it's easier and smarter generally to say canis species if you don't know. It's easier to say that saying, you know, this could be a dog, this could be a coyote, but we're not certain. The next side I wanna talk about is uh, South Diamond Creek Pueblo. It is on the north side of the Mimbris Magillon area. And it was excavated by Dr. Fumi Arakawa and his New Mexico State University Field School. What's really cool about this mandible on the top here, which is the, the burial or the animal from South Diamond Creek Pueblo, is that it was found in the roof wall of a great kiva. So it looks like the, the roof was collapsed in a burning event, partially, most likely part of a ceremonial um, closure. And what's interesting though, is that it doesn't actually, the, the bone itself is not actually burnt. So, this nice waxy texture that you can see and this nice lighter tan color um, basically really shows that it hasn't been burned. Unlike this is actually the dog from Kip Ruin down here. And it's a darker color. It has a drier, flakier type of texture to it because it was burnt. So this, this mandible on top from South Diamond Creek was either protected by other artifacts in that roof fall or potentially placed after the fact, after the burning event was done. And these two um, actually come from probably about, that, about the same time. It was a Georgetown phase great kiva that they excavated. So they're both from approximately 600 AD. All right, the last case study I wanna talk about before getting into Kip Ruin is Casas Grandes. And that's a very, very large site with many components primarily occupied in the 13th and 14th century for its, its largest population. There are about 51 dogs from 40 proveniences found at Casas Grandes, but um, it's hard to say how many might be the same dog in multiple locations, multiple proveniences, or um, how many of them were very complete because that, those numbers aren't really actually in the um, eight volume to peso set. There are also 26 coyotes from Casas Grandes which led those, the, the difference between those numbers led McCusick to suggest that dogs were eaten at Casas Grandes, but there doesn't actually appear to be any evidence for this on the bones there. She doesn't 
talk about any um, cut marks or anything else associated with butchering and eating of the animals. So I'm going to be a little bit skeptical of that. Um, many of those dogs were interred with humans or turkeys. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is actually pretty common to find turkeys and dogs together in different um, ritual contexts. That's evident really at Mancos Canyon in southwestern Colorado. Um, they were the, the only two domesticated species, so they had sometimes some of these special roles. And this is something that I find really interesting from Casas Grandes. Um, in the field, they labeled this a dog. <laughs> uh, so when I first got this picture, um, somebody else had, had mentioned that this picture, they had seen this picture of a, a dog burial. So I requested this number that they very kindly told me about. And I was really confused. I was baffled at first looking at this. I'm like, it says dog, but I know that these are not dog bones. <laughs> and then when I, I mean, this, this skull is a little bit faint. So I had to pull it up first um, and really expand it before I could actually tell. But this entire thing is the mandible. And that is really, really long, really big and the wrong shape for being a dog. And so I, I looked at it for a little bit and then I went back through the eight volume set <laughs> from Casas Grandes by De Peso. And after looking through a couple of the books, I came across some notes that it was in fact a pronghorn fawn. So it's a baby pronghorn antelope. And that would make it probably, you know, close to the same size range as a dog. Um, and really in the Southwest, a lot of times that's how we end up determining, you know, what something is, is we, we classify it at first by what, or in faunal analysis, I should say, we classify something first by the size that it fits into, which size category. Is it a large mammal? Is it a medium mammal or a small mammal? Or is it a bird? Or it's always gets put in a separate little pile. <laughs> so this one turned out to be one of those interesting cases. And yet again, um, you know, it's really, especially in the field when you don't have a good view of anything. I mean, all of these bones are still half in the, the dirt and, and very dirty. It's really hard to be able to differentiate species. All right, and then now we're going to move on to Kip Ruin. Kip Ruin is on the Deming Plain, uh, northwest of the Little Florida Mountains near Deming, New Mexico. And it is south of the Mimbris Valley, so it's not included in the Mimbris Valley, but it is on the Mimbris River. So Prehistorically, at some point, and nobody knows, <laughs> this is where the Membris River was running above ground at some point. We do not know for sure if it was running above ground when the site, which is here, and then blown up here, we don't know if it was running above ground at the time that this site was occupied. This site was occupied um, as early as 100 BC and all the way through the cliff phase, which is about 1300 to 1450, somewhere in that time period. And you'll notice that we have all of these nice lines running across the site everywhere. Avocationalists had gone through this site extensively, pot hunting and looking for interesting artifacts. So it scarred the landscape quite a bit, but there was still obviously a lot of really interesting things that, was, that were found from this site during excavations. Um, it was excavated under the direction of Bill Walker from 2006 to 2011 uh, and the New Mexico State University Field School. And this is a view from the site. So you're looking southeast at the Little Floridas on the left and the Florida Mountains on the right. A lot of people say that the Floridas look like a sleeping dragon. Um, they have these very sharp, jagged peaks that I've heard from personal experience from my husband and many others that they are very, very difficult to hunt in. It is rough terrain. They're a little bit scary. <laughs> All right, and then this is a map of showing that same that same picture, but it's been overlain with um, basically all of the details of what we've found there for the site. This was the primary excavation where these pueblos, this pueblo occupation here. Um, there's also this really interesting medicine hole that I believe the owners of the land had found a lot of really exciting artifacts, a lot of arrow points. Um, turquoise and shell artifacts were found in there. And then up here is where they found the Kipperwin dog burial. And so you'll notice that that spot is very far away from where they were actually focusing their excavation. And that's because they were doing soil samples. They were using an auger on a grid and it was a five meter grid. And so 
every intersection like you see on this map is where they were drilling an auger hole. And obviously, I think they were drilling about a meter down because um, Bob Derby told me that when they when they hit this the skull of this dog, he could hear the the pop sound that it made. So they knew they had hit something. And when they pulled the auger back up, they noticed that there were these teeth in there. And Bob Bob thought it was a dog burial right away. And so they put pin flags in, expecting to be able to go back and um, <laughs> dig it back up. Except that. Uh, the cows trampled the pin flags while they were gone. So by the time they came back, they could not actually find the right location. So unfortunately, they ended up digging, I believe, five meters to the east, and they dug a one and a half meter cubed um, unit, just like the one you see on the right. Only instead of finding a dog burial, like they hoped at the towards the bottom of it, they found nothing. <laughs> so they regrouped and remeasured and went back and dug five meters to the west and found this dog burial a meter below the ground. And because they had that knowledge, that advanced knowledge of exactly where the dog burial was going to be um, depth wise, they were able to be very careful when they excavated it to know that they were not um, disturbing it beyond anything that had already previously happened. So here is a close up of that dog. Um, it's the best photo we've got from these shadows in there, <laughs> but it was from a field school. So you can see you've got the skull here. We've got long bones from the front of the body. Um, this looks like the humerus right here. And then we've got um, the back legs are right here. And so there's this nice section right here that looks like it's probably missing a bunch of stuff. And I'll get to that later. This is where you can see a nice close up of that auger hole. And, you know, as unfortunate as it is that we don't have this intact skull, because I just got done telling you all of these how important it is to have an intact skull for identification, um, it's still really important to remember that we would not have this dog burial at all. We would not be able to um, examine or study this dog burial at all if that auger hole didn't happen. So, it is the only reason why we are able to do this research at all. So right here, you've got, this is the zygomatic, this is the cheekbone, the left cheekbone of the dog. This is where the, the muzzle is, the snout, and this is the back of the head. We've got some long bones down here. And then this is the entire excavated unit. This is when they had dug all the way to the bottom before they got to some solid caliche and there wasn't anything else below it. Um, this is approximately one meter down, and this is about where they would have found that dog, right just above this lens, I believe. And all of these little holes in this profile wall are actually pollen samples that they had um, taken. And when they, when they poked in these little pollen samples, in one of them, they actually discovered one of the metapodials for the dog. So this dog, um, as you can tell, is not in a perfectly pristine laid out, carefully laid out position like it probably was when it was buried. Um, but it does still have its bones in anatomical positioning to a certain extent. And so it does appear that this dog to a certain extent was probably placed in the grave, mostly intact, if not completely intact or, you know, in an anatomically correct position. Um, and then also, so some of what may have caused a lot of that is We've got all of these nice lines here that are fluvial deposits. And those are probably flooding from the Mimbris River. If you remember, it's just about 15 meters northwest of this exact burial location. So it does appear that the Mimbris River was probably flooding um, right around the same, right after, like, I guess not right after, but after the dog was um, placed in its burial. All right, and these are all sorts of artifacts. These are all the things that were found in the proveniences associated with the dog. It's not specifically just the burial pit because as I've shown you with that wall, with the metapodial that was sticking out of the wall rather, um, there are quite a few elements that were not found in that burial pit specifically. In fact, one of the, one of the tibiae, um, the shin bone, was found about 20 centimeters above the rest of the dog. And that, that could have probably been from one of the crotovenas that went through the burial pit. Cordovinas are rodent burrows. And one of them um, in Bob DeBry's report on the excavation, he mentions that one of them goes right underneath the dog's head. So we do know that there were crotovinas in and around that burial pit. 
And that could have very easily been what moved some of these phones into your different locations. So because of that, I, I took most of the artifacts that we had found from these proveniences that were excavated um, to be potential items that may have been in the burial pit, around the burial pit, or to tell us the story of what the burial pit was, where, it was, where the location was that it, that burial pit was dug into. So on number one up here that we have was my biggest mystery probably of the, all of this research. <laughs> The first time I saw this phone, it was labeled manubrium, which is part of the sternum. And I looked at it and immediately knew it could not be the manubrium. I tried to make it work, it didn't work. <laughs> it is not a manubrium. Uh, I talked to a couple of other faunal analysts. We decided at one point that it was part of the pelvis, but I still kept going back to it. It's just this one little fragment that was just eating at me. And it wasn't until I realized that um, I accepted that it might be from something other than Rudy that I suddenly realized what it was. <laughs> um, this is Rudy's atlas. This is the first cervical vertebrae that's what holds up his head. And this is the ventral arch of his atlas. So this is a ventral arch from another canid species um, for cervical vertebrae. So we have at least another either coyote or dog. It's much too big to be a fox and it's too small to be a wolf. So there's either another coyote or a dog in the same burial location as Rudy, which is very interesting and not uncommon in the Southwest. There are many locations where we find dogs that were buried together, um, sometimes many of them. And the main difference I want you to note though is that obviously this is a fragment, whereas Rudy's atlas is almost complete. And this is also burnt much more heavily than Rudy was. There are a lot of faunal remains, including this down here, this, this um, deer metapodial. There are a lot of faunal remains from these PDs to these proveniences that were extremely burnt. And they're most likely um, from a kitchen midden. So a lot of them were um, things that had been, you know, potentially discarded after being eaten. They had been burnt to you know, help clean up the site and stop attracting from attracting predators and such. So let's see. Number two and number five here are not, they don't fit back together, but they are both pieces of vesicular basalt and they are part of the fragments of a matate, which would have been used as the, the stone that maize would have been ground on. Um, and they're burnt, which is really interesting. Uh, Rudy is a bit burnt, on, especially on his joints and such. And so, but most of the other artifacts throughout this provenience and these proveniences were not burnt. So it, it's interesting to note the things that were burnt because they may have actually been with the dog and then moved into the burial pit together. I don't really know for sure. Um, and then number three are two pieces of, um, Membrous, bolt, uh, membrous black on white, or membrous white wares, I should say. Got to get this right for Tony. <laughs> um, and there's suspicion that they might be bold faced, but they're not large enough actually for us to determine for sure. So they're considered undifferentiated white wares. But these would have most likely post dated the dog burial by at least 100 years. And so those crudovinos really you know, come into play when we're looking at artifacts like this, because these kind of skew our, our date range that we expected to find the dog. So um, it is good to know that there was this bioturbation that happened that, that likely brought in later artifacts into an earlier burial pit. Um, on, I'll move my, my little icon here. Yeah, number four over here up in the top right, that is, those are lithics from, they're lithic flakes and they actually represent lithics from every stage of production for stone tools. Um, we went through every single one of those very painstakingly. Thank you, Stan Berryman <laughs> um, and Dale Frost. And we catalyzed every single one of those and found out how many of them we had of various different stages. And at the end of the day, we just decided, you know, we've got, we've got shirts, we've got a little bit of a obsidian, we've got some quartzite, we've got some interesting stuff here. Um, but we do have lithics as from every stage of production. And that kind of led us to see that maybe this was a midden deposit. There's a lot of, a lot of um, trash here. There's a lot of uh, leftovers that were discarded. Um, number six is a hand scraper. And that actually, it really does have a really nice hand feel to it. Like you can fit that nice thicker part in your, 
in your palm and hold it, maybe scrape off some hides. Um, number seven is a San Francisco red uh, rim. Thank you, Tony, yet again. <laughs> um, and that was something that gave, gave Tony Lumba the ability to help me understand exactly how old this dog might be before we had it radiocarbon dated. She pointed out that that's a pretty diagnostic time period of 400 to 600 AD, and she ended up being spot on. That was a very helpful observation. Um, number eight is a San Pedro point. Uh, it's got a broken chipped corner there, but it is an archaic point, and that's what makes it really interesting is that this was either curated or collected, but it definitely predates the dog by at least 100 years, maybe maybe much more than that. Um, numbers 9 and 11 are Alma Plain Shirts, and 11 is from an above the dog burial, in the layers above the dog burial, and 9 is a much larger shirt. From below the dog burial. And what makes that interesting to me is that we have underneath all of that extra weight, these larger sherds, that was just one of many, these much larger sherds that are positioned well below the dog with all of this weight on it. So maybe, you know, a bunch of those ones um, in that photo from 11 had broken and, and broken up more because of the, some of that bioturbation and those fluvial events, I'm not really sure. But I always found it interesting that we have these much larger sherds below the dog. Um, 10 is a spindle whirl. 12 is just a, a mono for grinding corn on top of that matate. Uh, 13 is a, a um, projectile point mid shaft. We don't know what, what style because it's just a, a small portion of it. And then 14 is that deer metaporeal I was telling you about. It's been broken in half, it's been cracked down the center and split, um, and it does have some cut marks on it and it's obviously burnt. But what's interesting is that this is the stage before they're turned into an actual like bone awl. So this is a preform for an awl most likely. It doesn't have any use wear evidence on it, so it's probably never actually used as an instrument like that, but it, it most likely was on its way to, to becoming one. All right, and here he is, or <laughs> I keep saying he, but I don't actually know the sex of this dog. Um, all of the methods that I had originally attempted to establish for determining the sex of this dog um, have been actually proven to be not very <laughs> accurate. So we have a, a, a pretty well completed animal here. I would like to point out that these foot bones right here, these metapodials, even though I have them all together, they are interestingly when I actually was able to um, find a veterinary manual to determine which was which, they all come from different feet. So we have one foot bone from three different feet. And then the toe bones that are next to them, I'm not really sure where those, where those ones fit either because they're really pretty hard to determine side and positioning for them. What I would like you to note though on this jog is that we don't have a lot of those finger bones. They, they very well could have you know, been washed away or you know, not noticed in the burial pit or you know, just aside just outside of that unit that was excavated. But um, we also don't have a lot of the vertebrae and the tail. And it's a very good possibility that a lot of those went with the hide when the hide was taken off of this dog. This dog does appear to have been um, butchered, skinned, butchered, decapitated. Um, there's a, a lot of stuff going on that happened to this dog before he died and shortly thereafter. Um, I do want to point out that a lot of the breaks that occur, occur on these joint areas um, because this is where the areas of most burning, this is a little bit darker you can see than this, this mid shaft section here. And that's most likely um, because there was meat on this animal still when it was burnt. And so that protected, that flesh protected the mid shaft area. So it's got a lighter hue to it. And then those darker, more burnt ends are much more fragile and they're easily, more easily broken in the ground. And then this is the side that that auger went through. Um, it, my guess is the way that this break looks with the mandible, this is probably broken by the auger. Um, it might've been intact in the burial. We will never know. All right. Um, and then this is, this is just um, a slide to kind of give an idea of how I knew and how I could tell that this is a dog instead of a coyote. Um, so it's like I said, it's very, very complex. You really have to have a lot of a lot of parts to 
to kind of determine that with any kind of certainty. Um, one of the, the measures that, that is given often is the auditory bulla are so the, the distance between the width between the auditory bulla is greater than the width of the auditory bulla. And then on the tooth, this is the um, first maxillary molar, or first, sorry, first mandibular molar. And this is the buccal cusp, and this is the lingual cusp. So this is the cheek side, and this is the tongue side. And this is supposed to be twice the size of this on dogs. And then I think on coyotes, they're relatively even. Um, at least in theory. <laughs> and then on the mandible, we have this ascending ramus again that points posteriorly, it curves backward. And then interestingly, and you know, not enough research has really been done to show how accurate this is or how often this happens on other species as well, but there is a lot of suspicion that this missing first premolar right here is very indicative of North American prehistoric domestic dogs. Um, the jury's still out on that one, but this dog, in fact, does not have that first premolar. There is no hole for the tooth. There's no tooth socket at all, and it doesn't appear that there ever was one, although, you know, they can close if there's a loss. Um, and the other thing, too, that I'll note while I've got this slide up is this dog is a fully mature dog. Um, we can tell by the fact that there are no no puppy teeth present, and there's actually a great deal of wear. That's what this is. You see um, the dentine exposure from a lot of wearing down on the teeth, and that really only happens usually with at least some age. So this dog was fully mature, but beyond that, there's actually no current method for aging a dog. All right, so these are different, different bits of evidence to show what kind of what kinds of things happened to this dog before it was buried. Um, the first thing we have up here is that there is a, it looks like there was a fresh bone fracture right here. And so it's possible that the dog was killed by being hit over the head, maybe probably with a rock or some other large heavy object. Uh, and that's what causes this type of a fracture with this, this plane like this and these little lines coming off of it. It was also, chopped up, this is the, the pelvis, this is the left pelvis, the top of the left pelvis. Um, the, these are probably from skinning, and so are these. These are, this is the metapodial. Um, these are skip marks, actually. So you've got a much deeper groove here, and all of these do have the, the nice V shape of those stone tool markings. So that first one in red there is the, the deepest and, and the sharpest. And then that one in yellow is a little bit more shallow and a little bit more like a check mark shape. And then the one in blue, as the knife is, is like sliding down it, is, is very shallow cut as the knife skips along that bone, most likely while it was, they were um, attempting to carefully skin it. And then we have these cut marks to the atlas right here. There's some up here, some down here. And then this axis right here, which is the, the vertebrae directly beneath it, um, has a missing transverse process right here. And what all of this kind of tells me is that they were looking for the location to take the dog's head off. And this is a common thing um, in hunting. And this is something that's actually noted in ethnographic accounts in the Southwest. Um, so it, it wouldn't be too surprising for them to take off the dog's head as part of um, either a ritual process or as part of just simply processing the animal's remains. And then the steamer that I have on the right is, is kind of a close up to give you an idea of that gradient burning that we see. Um, down here, we have the darkest, most burnt portion, which would be the least covered in meat and most likely the most exposed in any kind of a fire. And then it's a little bit lighter through here. Okay, um, radiocarbon dating. So it's very interesting that the dog came back at 545 to 645 AD with about 93% certainty because that's almost exactly the Georgetown phase of the Mimbrist Mugion, uh, which is 550 to 650. And I don't want to get too deep into the isotopic work because it gets kind of, <laughs> gets kind of hairy, but the C13 data is really important for us. It, it really helps us understand 
that is a very high number. Negative 7.4 is actually a very high number. I know it's a negative, trust me. Um, and that, what that tells us is that this dog was eating a very high portion of maize in its diet for um, mostly animals that were eating maize. So um, negative 7.4 falls within a range that Bob Hart actually had established for humans that were eating mostly maize, like very maize heavy diet prehistorically. Um, and then this nitrogen number, 12.4, just tells us how high up on the food chain the dog was eating. And this is a pretty high number. Um, most of the humans in the area that in, in the Southwest that I had looked at were below 10.0. And so to have the dog higher than that could indicate a few things. It could, eat, it could mean that the dog was eating other carnivores potentially, um, which isn't a very likely scenario, but it's a possibility if it were being fed a special diet. Um, or it is potentially eating human feces because other, you know, bodily matter contains nitrogen. And as you consume um, nitrogen and other things that are consuming nitrogen, the, no the number compounds, the, the, the rate compounds. And so the number only gets higher all the way up the food chain that way. And this is just a quick part to go over really quickly the, the numbers as Rudy compares to the rest of the Southwest. So this one's Rudy, all of these other nice little open circles are other dogs. And so you can see a lot of them are eating a very similar amount of maize, just a little bit less than Rudy maybe. And then one is actually eating more, more maize and is even higher up the food chain just by a little bit than Rudy. Um, very briefly on the strontium. Um, I actually analyzed the strontium, I processed the strontium myself. Uh, so this is the, the procedure for cation exchange chromatography. And that is just to extract the strontium from the bones and tooth enamel. I also processed members river water and soil from the burial. And really what, what it all tells me is that um, the bones are very similar to the soil. Um, and so they, it most likely means that the dog lived near Kipruin or at Kipruin before it died. And then the tooth enamel is interesting because it has a much higher signature, which is much closer to what we've seen at uh, an area around Cliff, New Mexico. And so future research will give us more of an idea as to whether that means that um, maybe the people had traveled from there. Right now, it's, it's really hard to say. It's really just very preliminary stage for being able to say too much about that movement possibility. But it's a very good likelihood that um, some future research will show you know, movement throughout the Southwest showing using strontium isotopes. All right, and then the future research that we've got lined up with um, Rudy so far is that I have an ADNA sample in that we're hopefully going to get back <laughs> sometime from the National Institutes of Health. And there's also a bunch of hairs. I think we have 60 plus hairs that were found in the burial pit and in the soil that was actually cleaned off of the bones when they were in the lab first. And um, you know, we don't know for sure if any of those hairs are going to turn out to be dog hairs, but we do have an expert coming in to let us know if some of them might be dog hairs. And that'd be really interesting. A lot of them appear to be white, which uh, would be pretty cool because a lot of those sashes in the Southwest that are made out of dog hair are made out of white dog hair. All right, and I just really quick would like to thank a lot of people for all of their help. I'd like to thank Ethan, Carly, and Chester for hosting me on this Mesa talk. Um, I'd like to thank my committee advisors and the Berrymans and the Lumbas. These are all the people that really, really helped me learn a lot about Southwest archaeology. And um, I'm really grateful. So thank you guys very much. I would love to thank you. So, uh, <laughs> Feel free to ask some questions. Yeah, um, thank you for that wonderful talk, Amanda. Uh, some of you may have uh, even uh, recognized the topic from uh, from Pecos a couple of years ago, but you've clearly uh, developed the project a fair bit since then. Um, yeah, let's check on here. Let's see if we have uh, if we have any questions. And uh, Amanda, hi, Chester. Can the live stream hear me? Uh, yes, they can. Yes. Okay. So um, William asks, 
what kind of information can the DNA give us? Um, well, one of the cool things that I would love to know with the DNA is uh, what other dogs in the Southwest you might be related to. So establishing any kind of connections between dogs within the Southwest would give us a better idea of, of human relationships potentially. So we could maybe learn where these dogs traded. Um, does this show us some migrations, some human migrations and human movement? Um, or, you know, maybe are all of them related, which I doubt. <laughs> uh, maybe we can understand how they got through this to the Southwest, where they came from, because the two oldest dogs, or the, I guess, four oldest dogs that we have, three of them are from Southern Illinois, and one of them is from Northeast Alaska, or Southeast Alaska, so, um, you know, it's really, it'd be really interesting to find out what dog this dog is related to. That DNA can also tell us, potentially, it depends on, on how well the preservation is, and if they can get more than just mitochondrial DNA, um, it would maybe be able to tell us the color of the fur. It would definitely be able to tell us the sex of the dog. Um, there's there's quite a lot of a lot of interesting little, you know, tidbits we might be able to learn about the dog just by the DNA. Awesome. Um, another question came in and says, have any forensic artists recreated these dogs? Oh. Um Certainly not Rudy. That would be absolutely amazing. <laughs> that would be on it, Amanda. I know. <laughs> well, Let yeah, me that would be really cool. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> awesome. Do you have some, Chester? Uh, I was just going to ask if we have any more questions, or um, if there's, uh, if not, if you have any um, uh, parting words, Amanda. Like no Not really. I've really enjoyed. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed this research so far. I hope to keep working on funnel analysis in the Southwest. It is my passion. This is, and I find it really, really interesting. So uh, hopefully I'll get to do some other big projects um, coming up. And yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for talking. A really fascinating talk. And um, yeah, we, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, so looks like that's that's all that we have for now. Um, thank you, everyone on the stream for uh, uh, for joining us. Uh, I hear that we might have had some uh, audio trouble at, at some point, uh, but uh, hopefully um, it doesn't sound like it was anything serious. Uh, just my internet connection here is not terribly great. Uh, but we've also been recording this so that we'll make this available on our YouTube channel, like always. And um, yeah, uh, Carly, do you know who we have lined up for uh, next month? I do not, but we are sure hoping oh. it's going to be in person as well as streamed, um, which will be very exciting. So uh, Los Santos Historic Site, for those of you that don't know, is in Alcalde, New Mexico, which is north of Santa Fe. So hopefully we will have it in person, um, but we will also always be streaming it online too. I think according to my notes here, we're hoping to get Seb Foles to, uh, to talk. So uh, that's another archeologist Excellent. who's doing research right in the, this area of Los Luceros and Mesa Prieta. So uh, stay tuned. Hopefully uh, we'll get uh, Professor Foles on here. And um, otherwise we'll see you next month, everyone.